Many centuries before the Targaryen conquest of Westeros, the dragon lords of the Valyrian Freehold expanded from the Valyrian Peninsula to rule over all of Western Essos, defeating ancient, well-established civilizations to populate their own settlements, some of which were founded and governed independently of the homeland, retaining a status as free cities, able to choose their own leaders and administer their own affairs, while remaining under the purview and protection of Valyria. Though other cities of Western Essos earned great wealth and fame, such as Menteris, Voluntheris, Oros, Tyria, Draconis, Illyria, Misafer, Rios, and Aquosten, they were all governed directly by agents of the Freehold and did not retain the influence and long-term viability of the nine free cities. When the Doom of Valyria destroyed the Freehold and broke apart the peninsula in 102 BC, Many eastern and western settlements, dependent on the homeland, were utterly destroyed throughout the century of blood that followed. Some of the few settlements to survive these bleeding years were the nine free cities of Essos, which nonetheless suffered many hardships and wars, but also adapted to the changing times, relying more heavily upon trade routes to their nearest neighbors like the Summer Isles and Westeros, with some of these city-states developing political and military ties to the Seven Kingdoms. The oldest of the free cities, Volantis, first daughter of Valyria, was founded as a western military outpost some time after the conquest of Old Gis in the east. Taking advantage of the protection offered from such a settlement, wealthy merchants used it as a trading post between the Valyrian Peninsula and Roinar city-states, growing increasingly wealthy in the following years. Emerging victorious in the Roinish Wars, the Freehold eventually wiped out their northern neighbor, leaving Volantis as the most influential and powerful city of the region. Following the doom of Valyria, Volantis considered itself the natural successor to the Freehold, sending a fleet to reconquer the shattered remnants of the Valyrian Peninsula, which then vanished in the Smoking Sea. Failing to assert their authority, Volantis next marched their armies and sailed another fleet to successfully conquer the free cities of Myr and Lys, before moving on to Tyrosh, where their dreams of expansion were crushed by the combined efforts of Tyrosh, the rebels of Lys, the rebels of Myr, the Stormlands of Westeros, the Targaryens of Dragonstone, Pentos and Bravos, as well as Kohor and Norvos, which allied to defeat them in the north. The Dothraki horse lords of central Lesos then took advantage of the chaos by raiding Valentine towns and villages in the east. Proud of their heritage, only those of Valyrian descent were permitted to live within the 200 foot walls of fused black stone, while others could only enter by invitation. Divisions such as these aided in creating a deep political divide between the prestigious, old money aristocracy and the new money merchant class, further displayed in their political parties, with the noble and military aligned tigers opposed to the merchant allied elephants. Ruled by three triarchs which each served a one year term, all freeborn landowners were eligible to vote in elections that were usually peaceful but involved aggressive campaigning and bribery. Inventing the famed board game Savas, the port of Volantis served as a lucrative gateway to Slaver's Bay and the Jade Sea in the east, trading heavily in slaves as well as silk, spices, sweet beets, and sweet red wine. A notable figure from Volantis was the fool Patchface, serving under King Stannis Baratheon, a mentally impaired man who may have possessed the gift of prophecy. Originally established by a long-forgotten people, the lands of Norvos were conquered by the Hairy Men, who were then driven out by the Roinar under Prince Garrus of Nysar. Yet in time, the Roinar abandoned the region, preferring the warmer climates of the south. Seeking to escape the religious tolerance of the Valyrian Peninsula, a sect of extremists following bearded priests migrated to this abandoned settlement and founded the city of Norvos. Pledging allegiance to the Freehold while retaining their own leadership structure, they established a strict theocracy administered by a council of magisters whose members were chosen by the bearded priests. Worshipping a mysterious god whose name was only revealed to initiates of the priesthood, the city came under threat from the Andals of the Lorathi Isles when King Carlon the Great attempted to expand his empire southward. Resisting conquest, the Norvosi contacted the Motherland, which sent a hundred dragons from Valyria to destroy the Andal King, his army, and his homeland in a massacre remembered as the Scouring of Lorath. During the Century of Blood, Norvos briefly allied with neighboring Kohor to win the battle on Dagger Lake, where they halted Valentine expansion into the north of Essos. Developing a unique society and culture, the Norvosi largely based their schedule around the ringing of three bells, which told them when to rise, sleep, work, pray, rest, take up arms, and have intimacy. As none but the priests could have beards, many men grew long mustaches, while women shaved their heads bald and wore wigs. 
Known to eat winter cakes and drink nasa, fermented goat's milk laced with honey, the Norvosi produced beautiful tapestries and engaged in trade with nearby cities like Lorath. Among the most well-known figures from Norvos was Ario Hota, captain of the guard for Prince Doran Martell of Dorne, as well as this ruler's wife, Lady Malario, mother to his three children, who was so appalled by the Westerosi custom of fostering children with another noble family, she grew estranged from her husband and eventually returned to her homeland. The northern free city of Lorath upon the Lorathi Isles was the smallest, poorest, and least populated of the nine free cities, yet was once a home to a mysterious ancient people, which built tall mazes out of carved stone. Expanding across the isles and onto mainland Essos to the south, the Maze Maker civilization eventually ended, allowing for the Harrymen to settle the islands until they too vanished, possibly driven out by the Andal people, expanding from the Axe across the north of Essos to the western coast. For many years, the Lorathi Isles were ruled by various competing Endo kings, until eventually conquered by Carlon the Great, who sought to expand his empire onto mainland Essos, winning a number of victories before encountering significant resistance from the free city Norvos. Reaching out for aid to the motherland of Old Valyria, the Dragon Lord sent a mighty host to destroy King Carlon and his army as they laid siege to the city. The Valyrians then pressed forward and destroyed all the king's holdings upon the Lorathi Isles in a brutal slaughter known as the Scouring of Lorath. Leaving no survivors, the islands remained abandoned for over a century until 1436 BC, when settled by a sect of highly religious Valyrians, who established a temple to the blind god Boash on the largest of the three main islands, which in time grew to become the free city Lorath. Building much of the settlement within the ancient stone mazes of the island, the eunuch priests of Boash ruled sternly while adhering to strict religious beliefs, like refusing to eat flesh or drink wine. Practicing self-abnegation, they did not allow slavery and were so extreme in their belief of equality, they denied their individuality in the language they used, describing themselves as a man or a woman instead of I or you. Though their religion did not persuade many to convert, their message of equality greatly resonated with outsiders, attracting escaped slaves and beleaguered freedmen, so that in time the followers of Boash were a minority. By about 700 BC, the ruling faction of religious priests grew so corrupt the people rebelled, establishing a new society and leadership structure headed by a harvest prince, fisher prince, and prince of the streets, though these were largely ceremonial positions as true authority rested with a council of magisters. Exporting salt cod, walrus tusks, seal skins, and whale oil, Lorath had few soldiers or warships and so largely remained isolationist in their ambitions, rarely interfering in the affairs of others while trading mostly with their nearest neighbors. A known figure from Lorath was the faceless assassin Jack and Hagar, who killed three men for Arya Stark and invited her to Bravos, where she might find the Temple of Black and White. The easternmost of the free cities, Kohor, also known as the City of Sorcerers, was founded as a Valyrian lumber camp to extract timber from the forest of Kohor, but in time was settled by a sect of religious dissidents worshipping the infamous Black Goat, a dark god demanding daily blood sacrifices, requiring animals on normal days, criminals on holy days, and children of noblemen in times of crisis. A city of sorcery, the people of Kohor were said to practice divination, blood magic, and necromancy. After the Doom of Valyria, the Dragon Lord Aurian rallied 30,000 soldiers from Kohor to declare himself the first Emperor of Valyria before leading his army south to reconquer the Valyrian Peninsula. Yet the Dragon Rider and his followers were never heard from again. During the century of blood that followed the destruction of Valyria, Kohor neared annihilation when they were targeted by a Dothraki Kalasar of 50,000, half of whom were braided warriors ready for battle. Easily defeating the mercenary army assembled to fight for Kohor, the only defenders remaining were 3,000 unsullied slave soldiers purchased from Astapor. Highly prized eunuchs trained all their lives for battle, the unsullied did not feel pain and were renowned for their discipline. Even so, few could have expected those 3,000 footmen to repel an army of 25,000 mounted warriors, yet the unsullied miraculously succeeded, repelling 18 charges while killing 12,000 of the enemy, including their leader Kaltemo and his sons. Defeated, the Horse Lords marched through the city gates and cut off their braids, throwing them to the ground as a symbol of surrender. Of the 3,000 Unsullied who fought that day, only 600 survived, but they so impressed the government and people, the city was thereafter permanently defended by an Unsullied army whose soldiers were given Dothraki braids to adorn their weapons. For many years, Kohor prospered as a trading hub between the free cities and the realms of the East, but after the Dothraki wiped out many of those realms, financial opportunities lessened. 
Yet they remained a wealthy city-state, trading with any and all they could, including the Dothraki capital of Vez Dothrak, where they could find items from faraway lands like Yiti. Famous for their hunters, foresters, and artisans, their most prosperous industry was in selling timber to Salores, Valisar, Volantheris, Volantis, and many others. They also produced great tapestries, wooden carvings, and were expert smiths, retaining the secret for how to rework Valyrian steel. Well-known figures from Kohor included Vargo Hoat, leader of the Brave Companion's mercenary company, and Tobo Mott, a blacksmith hired by Tywin Lannister to reforge the Valyrian steel sword Ice, creating Widow's Whale and Oathkeeper. Once a wealthy Valyrian trading post, some claim the city of Pentos was founded by merchants, sailors, and farmers who owed allegiance to the Freehold, while others say the settlement was founded before the Dragon Lords expanded west, but the people swore fealty to the Dragon Lords rather than attempt resistance. Whatever the case, the population mixed freely with the local Andal population, growing the city's influence until they controlled nearly the entire region of Andalos along the western coast. Gaining independence after the Doom of Valyria, Pentos was originally ruled by a prince chosen from among 40 powerful noble families. But in time, power shifted to a council of wealthy magisters, who prioritized keeping the city a hub of trade and financial opportunities. Relegated to a largely ceremonial position, the prince presided over balls, feasts, and rituals, like his deflowering of two virgins at the beginning of each year, coupling with the Maiden of the Sea and fields, to ensure prosperity in the months ahead. Though the prince lived a life of abject luxury, during times of crisis, he was sacrificed to appease the gods and a new prince was chosen. During the Century of Blood, they avoided catastrophe by paying generous tributes to several Dothraki Kalasars and joined an alliance with the free city Tyrosh to successfully resist Valentine expansion. Fighting several wars with Bravos to the north, Pentos was eventually subdued and forced to sign a peace agreement, heavily restricting their military capabilities to less than 20 warships while unable to hire mercenaries. The treaty also outlawed slavery in Pentos, though the rich found ways around this, charging their workers outrageously for food, clothing, and shelter, creating more debt than they could ever earn through labor, leaving them no choice but to work for their master the rest of their lives. Trading heavily with realms near and far, some of their greatest partners were across the narrow sea in Westeros, developing cordial relations that eventually, to some degree, intertwined their politics, peoples, and cultures. Pentos even served as a temporary home for famous Westerosi, like the future king Prince Maegor Targaryen and the father of two future kings Prince Daemon Targaryen. Producing pale amber wine, Pentoshi were also known to trade in spices like saffron, as well as peppers, cheese, gemstones, and dragonbone. Well-known figures from Pentos included Magister Illyrio Mopatis, a friend to Varys the Spider who advised various Westerosi kings, as well as the tattered prince who led the windblown mercenary company. Further south along the western coast of Essos, the city of Mir prospered as a culture devoted to education and the arts, becoming one of the most advanced of the free cities. Though the region may have been populated by an ancient civilization in the past, it eventually became a walled Andal town until Valyrian adventurers conquered the region and established a trade hub. During the Century of Blood, Mir and its sister city Lys were conquered by Volantis, but eventually rebelled and with the aid of many allies won their freedom. Ruled by a conclave of magisters, Mir was home to some of the finest artisans in the world, producing exceptional glassware, tapestries, paintings, miniatures, fire wine, pale green nectar wine, thin stilettos, telescopes, carpets, blankets, screens, glasses, mirrors, lace, and a healing herb called Mirish Fire. Some notable Miranese figures included Thoros of Mir, a red priest pledged to the Brotherhood without banners, and Lady Sarala, wife of Lord Dennis Starklin, who many say encouraged her husband to rebel and imprisoned King Aris II during the defiance of Duskendale. Founded as a resort destination for the wealthy nobles of the Valyrian Freehold, Lys was a beautiful, sunny, fertile island teeming with palm and fruit trees. Over time, the settlement grew into a heavily populated and prosperous port city, specializing in the training of pleasure slaves, renowned far and wide for their pillow houses. Retaining the blood of old Valyria, the people of Lys were extremely beautiful, often producing children with silver-gold hair and purple eyes. During the Century of Blood, Lys and its sister city Mir were conquered by Valantis, but eventually rebelled and with the aid of many allies won their freedom. Ruled by a conclave of magisters, Lys not only traded in pleasure slaves, but also red and white wines, fine tapestries, sweet perfumes, and fine long dirks, while also known to produce powerful poisons, including the Strangler and the Tears of Lys. 
Some well-known figures from Lys included the spymaster Varys the Spider, the pirate Salador San, and all of House Rogare, which for a time rose to prominence as owners of a wealthy bank who married one of their daughters to the future king of Westeros, Viserys II. Founded upon the Stepstones as a Valyrian military outpost designed to control trade along the Narrow Sea, the settlement soon blossomed into the city of Tyrosh when merchants discovered the region was home to several snail species, which could produce valuable dyes of many colors for trade. After the Doom of Valyria, some few dragons and noble lords survived in Tyrosh, but the population rose up to kill them and declare independence. During the Century of Blood, the powerful city Valentis captured Lys and Mir before attempting to conquer Tyrosh as well. Fortunately for the Tyroshi, this was considered a step too far by many, and great alliances formed to aggressively oppose Valentine expansion, with Pentos, Bravos, the Stormlands of Westeros, the Targaryens of Dragonstone, the Rebels of Myr, and the Rebels of Lys, all contributing to their enemy's defeat in the south, while Kohor and Norvo stopped their fleet in the north. Some centuries later, Tyrosh became home to the Westerosi exiles of House Blackfire and their supporters, only to be eventually conquered by Melis the Monstrous during the Fifth Blackfire Rebellion, also known as the War of the Ninepenny Kings. Yet when the armies of Westeros descended upon the Stepstones in 260 AC, the Band of Nine was defeated and Tyrosh regained its independence. Ruled by an Archon chosen from the most influential noble families, Tyrosh produced impressive armor and was heavily involved in the trade of slaves, dyes, and pear brandy. A well-known figure from Tyrosh was Dario Naharis, captain of the Stormcrow's mercenary company and ally to Daenerys Targaryen. Known as the quarrelsome daughters of Valyria, the sister cities Myr, Lys, and Tyrosh shared much in the way of culture, customs, language, religion, and a desire for trade. Yet after the fall of Old Valyria, the sister cities entered into an endless series of wars and raids, desperately fighting for possession of the fertile disputed lands, which then became a bloody war zone brimming with soldiers and mercenaries. Despite this history of violence and animosity, Mir, Tyrosh, and Lys set aside their differences to form the Kingdom of the Three Daughters in 96 AC. But after several disastrous wars, the Triarchy dissolved in 130 AC, and the cities once again turned on each other, fighting over the disputed lands for many years to come. The youngest of the Free Cities, Bravos was known as the Bastard Daughter because it was never a part of the Freehold, instead founded by escaped slaves who killed their masters and stole their ships to flee Valyria. Finding an isolated lagoon in the northern mountains, these escaped slaves settled the region and immediately outlawed slavery, naming it the First Law of Bravos. Keeping their existence hidden for over a century, the Sea Lord Uther Ozalin eventually sent ships far and wide to proclaim the existence of their city. To avoid the wrath of Old Valyria, financial settlements were offered to the descendants of those killed, paying for the theft of their ships while refusing to compensate the loss of slaves. Uninterested in conflict so far north, the Valyrians accepted the coin and offered no trouble. Fighting many wars over the years, some speak of a battle in which Bravos defeated the Kingdom of Sarnor, sinking the last enemy fleet at Bitterweed Bay. After the Doom of Valyria, Bravos exerted increasing control over trade in the Narrow Sea, involving themselves in the wars and politics of neighboring lands, including Westeros, the Stepstones, and other free cities like Lys, sending a hundred warships to help liberate their island and halt Valentine expansion into the west. Becoming the richest and most powerful of the free cities, Bravos prospered thanks in part to the highly successful Iron Bank which loaned money to foreign powers, as well as their robust sea and trade culture with their ships sailing as far east as Ashai. A canal city, they built the Titan of Bravos at the entrance to the harbor and were ruled by a sea lord who held the position for life, protected by a champion called the First Sword of Bravos. The sea lord was chosen by a number of magisters and key holders who comprised the city's powerful aristocracy. Known as a place of religious diversity, with temples and shrines of many faiths, perhaps the most infamous was the House of Black and White, where a group of assassins called the Faceless Men worshipped Death, who they named the Many-Faced God. In addition to producing expert ships and dark purple dyes, Bravosi were proficient fishermen, trading in many varieties of fish as well as oysters, eels, clams, rays, crabs, and crawfish. A diverse people, largely tolerant of others, they treated courtesans like princesses and developed a swordsman culture that saw bravos wandering the streets in flamboyant colors searching for a fight. They also invented a water dance fight and fencing style that emphasized speed, balance, grace, and accuracy. Well-known figures of Bravosi heritage included Sirio Farrell, a former first sword and mentor to Arya Stark, and Tycho Nestoris, a representative of the Iron Bank who made deals with Jon Snow of the Night's Watch and King Stannis Baratheon. 
In addition to the widely recognized nine free cities, other potential sediments nearly joined their ranks, like in the southern continent of Sotorios, where the city Gagosos was founded by the ancient Gascari Empire before becoming a penal colony for the Valyrian Freehold and a pirate's den after the doom. Growing rich off the slave trade during the Century of Blood, Gagosos was considered by some as the 10th free city until they were devastated by the Red Death Plague, seeing 9 of every 10 die in agony. Yet another near claimant was located in the Dothraki Sea, where Asaria was founded as a Valyrian colony, but was eventually granted the right to govern themselves, prospering greatly from trade with the Kingdom of Sarnor. But everything changed when the Doom of Valyria ushered in the Century of Blood, as both the Kingdom of Sarnor and Isaria were destroyed by the Dothraki horse lords rampaging through Essos. After their fall, the Dothraki renamed Isaria to Vez Kadok, meaning the City of Corpses, but many others referred to these ruins as the Lost Free City. A special thanks to all those who contribute to Civilization X, like Sir Daeron of House Ashford, Fred Heartless, Knight of Iron and Ice, Zong the Black Wolf, and Mamoru the Obscured Hermit Alchemist. If you'd like to help the channel, be sure to give a like, leave a comment, subscribe, and click on the links below, or else go to patreon.com slash civilizationx, where you can gain early access to videos, vote on future content, and watch the Patreon-only series, Heroes of Lore and Legend.